And just as a little background as we are getting started, this is part of our monthly webinar series that we provide to our network. Um, and we do this series to help um, inform communities around the country about some practicing promises around engagement and local issues. Um, so we're glad to have you all with us today and we encourage you to check out our um, full library of webinars which we'll send out in a follow-up email. Um, just to let you know, we are also recording this webinar and that will be available after the um, after the webinar as well, as along with the PowerPoint slides and lots of great extra material um, that both presenters have shared with us. Um, so again, today the title of the webinar is Building Community Trust Through Police Data and Dashboards. Um, and just a little background on the National Civic League. We are a nonprofit organization that's been around since 1894, and we try to advance communities through equitable engagement. And uh, June is a very big month for us. Our flagship program, the All-America City Awards, is happening in June. Um, and we encourage you all to check that out and um, consider attending. And uh, we are also doing a conference this year um, in conjunction with the All-America City Awards that I think those on this webinar will be particularly interested in. As you can see on your slide here, it's June 22nd in Denver, Colorado. We've got some amazing keynote speakers, um, but most importantly for this webinar, we have a community and police relations track. Um, so there'll be a full day of workshops just on police and community relations. Um, we've got some great ones set up um, on how to engage with youth and foster positive relationships with youth, how to um, include intentional civic engagement strategies within the 21st century um, policing report, um, and then finally how um, advocacy and community organizing can help um, foster better relationships between the community and police. And that sign up and more information on those workshops and the overall conference will be in your follow-up email as well. And we definitely encourage you all to check it out. And for everyone on this webinar, we will be offering a discounted registration for the conference as well. Okay, so that is kind of the brief overview of National Civic League and what we do and some of the great stuff we've got coming up. But I wanna make sure our speakers have plenty of time so we will go ahead and turn it over to Bob Scales. Bob? Hi, uh, thank you. And thanks so much for, uh, for the National Civic League for hosting this uh, presentation. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. And just to do a quick introduction, uh, my name is Bob Scales and I'm the CEO of Police Strategies and we're a consulting company and we work with police agencies to help them use their data to make better decisions. And uh, my background is I'm an attorney, I was a prosecutor in King County, Washington in the 1990s and then I worked for 14 years for the city of Seattle as a public safety policy advisor to several Seattle mayors and um, most recently I was in the Seattle City Attorney's Office and was there when the Department of Justice did their pattern of practice investigation of the Seattle Police Department in 2011. And that subsequently ended up in a consent decree that the department is still under. And I was responsible for overseeing the reforms uh, at the beginning of the consent decree. Um, and Chief Garcia, I'm not sure if he's, uh, he's have been having some audio problems. Chief, are you online yet? I am here. Okay, great. Do you want to do a, an introduction of yourself, Chief? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Eddie Garcia. I'm the Chief of Police in San Jose, California PD. Uh, I've been here um, actually starting my uh, 27th year. Um, worked, uh, I don't know, you, you, you name a unit, I probably worked it. I worked uh, special operations. I've worked in uh, administration. Uh, I've worked in the detective bureau. Uh, I have been the Chief of Police for going on two and a half years and I was the assistant chief uh, for three years prior to that. Great, if we could go to the next slide. And uh, I wanted to uh, show you a short uh, video from the FBI that talks about the importance of uh, collecting data on use of force. Police-involved shootings and use of force have long been topics of national discussion, but high-profile
high-profile cases in which subjects died have a heightened public awareness of these issues. The opportunity to study use of force incidents and discuss their cause is hindered by the lack of enough data to compile nationwide statistics. Data seems like a dry and boring word, but without it, we cannot understand our world and make it better. How can we address concerns about use of force? How can we address concerns about officer-involved shootings if we do not have a reliable grasp on the demographic and the circumstances of those incidents? We simply must improve the way we collect and analyze data to see the true nature of what's happening in our communities. Without complete and accurate data, we are left with ideological thunderbolts. And that helps spark unrest and distrust and does not help us get better. Hi, I'm Jim Comey. We at the FBI are thrilled to be working with our law enforcement partners to build a national use of force data collection. I truly believe we can't address issues about use of force and officer-involved shootings. We don't know the facts that enable us to have an informed discussion. Every conversation about policing at the national level is uninformed right now because we don't have the data. Bob, do we still have you with us? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, if if uh, are you able to see my screen now? Other uh, data yeah. collection projects. Okay, great. Yeah. So Thank so you. that was a that was a video from the FBI and obviously former Director James Comey talking about the the problems with the lack of data on on use of force and one of the obviously use of force is a is a very uh, large and controversial issue now. And one of the, the big challenges is that we don't have uh, any data to have an informed discussion. And police de departments don't have the data to make evidence-based data-driven decisions. And so as, as Director Comey pointed out, a lot of the, the things that are happening are happening in a vacuum. And there's no way to provide context and no way for both the police and the public to really understand what's happening. Um, there are some other. Um, efforts in addition to the FBI that's trying to build a, a database on, on officer-involved shootings and serious bodily injuries. Um, other organizations such as media organizations like The Guardian and The Washington Post have um, uh, created their own databases through crowdsourcing, just publicly available materials. And they actually have a better data set than the FBI currently has on officer-involved shooting deaths. Um, the FBI currently has about 500 incidents a year, and these databases have found uh, over 1,000 um, uses of force. California started uh, a couple of years ago their URSUS program, which requires all departments to also report to the state DOJ um, officer-involved shooting deaths and in custody deaths, as well as serious bodily injuries. And in 2015, President Obama launched the Police Data Initiative, uh, which collected data from over 150 departments on various things, including use of force. And there are about 26 agencies that have provided use of force data. The problem with all of these systems is that, number one, they're only collecting data on uh, in custody deaths or serious bodily injury, which are uh, about 1% or less of all the use of force that occurs. And so even though these databases are limited, um, they're also just, just focused on a very small fraction of the total issue. Um, and, and nobody knows for certain sort of how many use of force there are every year, but we can make some estimates. And every year, there are about 200 million calls for service for uh, police uh, service. And that results in 63 million face-to-face -face contacts. And about 31 million stops are made by the police every year. And that lead to 10 million arrests. And of those 10 million arrests, and this is an estimate that we have from our system, as well as some, from some academic research, there are about 400,000 uses of force. And this would be any physical force, any use of a weapon, or any type of, of force that results in, in injury or complaint of injury. 
So approximately 4% of all arrests in the country result in some type of use of force. And we estimate that about half of those use of force leads to some types of injuries. Most of these injuries are relatively minor, but about 50% some type of injury. And then approximately 1,000 deaths uh, result from the use of force. And one of the problems with the, the lack of data is that there's currently a huge disconnect between what the public thinks of policing and what police, how police view policing. And one of the questions uh, that a, a, a Pew Research Group um, did recently was, do Americans understand the risks and challenges that police officers face on the job? And there's a, a huge disconnect between what the public thinks. The public thinks they understand what's going on, uh, but the police don't think the public understands what's going on. So you can see that it's almost a complete reverse in terms of, of uh, uh, what each side views their understanding of policing. And as an example, another question they asked was, how often do officers discharge their firearms while on duty? And 83% of the Americans that responded to the survey believe that a typical officer fires his service weapon at least once during their career, and 30% believe that police officers fire their weapon multiple times each year. But when officers are surveyed, we find that only 27% of officers reported discharging their firearms during their careers. So this means that three quarters of the officers will never have the experience of discharging their, their weapon during their on, while on duty, much less being involved in an officer-involved shooting death. So it's a very rare occurrence, and most police officers are uh, 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 have no experience with it. Um, similarly, we have very different perceptions in terms of what happens when force is used. And this is from a, a Bureau of Justice Statistics Police Public Contact Survey. And of the, resident, of the uh, residents who said that they experienced use of force by the police, 87% did not believe that the police officer behaved properly, and 75% thought that the force used against them was excessive. Um, so that's obviously a, a vast majority of the people that have force used against them think it's inappropriate. But when police departments review the use of force, less than 2% are found to be out of policy. And so while the police are viewing their use of force as appropriate and within policy and constitutional, most of the people that have force used against them feel the opposite. And one of the big issues now, obviously, are, are the high-profile shootings that occur on video, either by officer body cameras or YouTube videos. And one incident involves uh, Philando Castillo in Minnesota, uh, who was shot and killed during a traffic stop. Another high-profile incident was the Eric Garner case uh, in Staten Island, where he ended up um, uh, dying. And part of the, uh, uh, you can see in the middle picture there, one of the techniques that was used was a lateral neck restraint or carotid restraint, sometimes known as a chokehold. Um, and so you have these very high profile incidents, often involving uh, African American men. And so one of the questions that um, the Pew Research Center asked was, uh, do um, our police uh, black encounters, are they isolated incidents? Or are they signs of a broader problem? And again, you see this vast disconnect where most officers think that these types of incidents are isolated issues, whereas most of the public believes that this is a sign of a broader issue and problem between policing and African-American males. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chief Garcia, and he's going to talk about some of the, the, the programs that he's implemented to try to, to bridge the gap between uh, uh, the police and the community and letting the community know more uh, data and information about what the department's doing. And then I'm going to go back and talk specifically about use of force data collection. So, Chief? And just, just let me know, Chief, when you want me to change the slide. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, OK. Well, one of the things that uh, I think needs to be clear when we talk about any of these issues is that they, they, they can't stand alone. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, just by getting one, one, one thing for the community or one thing to keep us uh, accountable and being able to see the tools we have in transparency, uh, the reality of that is, uh, that there is no one silver bullet. You know, you have to, we really have to um, make every effort 
to put into that, uh, you know, the, the, the emotional bank account is the way, you know, that I refer to it, really, and this is just one of those, one of those other tools. Um, and so we kind of underwent just a lot of things between before we even began with the dashboard, just reaching out to the community. You can change the, the slide up. You know, from, you know, the community meetings that we attend, uh, we attend four major, we, we actually host four major community meetings throughout the city that we do. This is our city, our city is divided into four divisions. And uh, so we have community meetings in each of our divisions where we actually give, we don't, we don't practice CompStat here. Uh, we practice a different type of accountability with regards to crime and regards to public safety. And we give those presentations out in the community. And so, uh, not only do we discuss it in, uh, internally, but also externally. Next slide, Bob. Another very useful tool that we use now as well is called the My90. And what My90 is able is able for us, it, what it enables us to do is to get feedback anonymously from our community. And so basically what we do is, you know, we kind of have a mantra here where before you know, we start any major public safety type of initiatives in areas of our city that need our presence, what we do is we also want to gauge not only how safe they feel in their neighborhoods, but also how trustworthy they feel towards the police. And throughout the process that we are engaging in public safety, we're able to gauge both um, how, how crime is, and that's an area that we normally can gauge pretty well, is how high or low or how well we're doing with regards to crime fighting. But what we don't do very well, I think, as a profession is reaching back out in those communities that we are, that, that need us there and that we're policing about their level of trust in the police. And this is a tool that really enables us to do that. The other thing we do with the My90 app, which has really been helpful, is when we do our presentations uh, in our divisions, in our community, what we normal what we do is you know we ask a series of questions with regards to that specific community uh, from their trust in police to how safe they feel uh, and those type of questions and based on those questions and those responses is what the topics are in the breakout sessions that we have where we have an officer with a group of of uh, residents discussing issues, and it's really the issues are based on the responses that the group gave um, in the My90 app. So that's been an enormous tool for us. Uh, next slide, Bob. Um, so this slide here, and I'll try to go through them quickly, but again, these are just some of the things. I don't like to call them reforms. I like to call them initiatives. Um, and there's some of the initiatives that we undertook here, uh, that we've undertaken here in San Jose in the you know, about two and a half years. And if you look, you know, if you highlight some, if you look at the policy and procedure changes from instituting a religious exemption to grooming standards to the no chokehold policy, we have a no head strike policy, um, you know, different new tactics on force. You know, one of the, you know, um, we have a four, uh, force tiered system which immediately triggers investigations within the police department because this, this police department, uh, you know, uh, investigations of force were only triggered with a complaint, uh, generally speaking. And, or unless, you know, there was specific evidence that was given. And a lot of things we felt that were better than that as an organization. So we have some tiered system now that, you know, with, uh, if, uh, you know, if you have a fracture, um, if someone goes unconscious, if you have to take someone to the hospital and things of that nature, they're automatic, that automatically triggers command review up into the chief's office. And it's reviewed at the chief's office level, and if it's deemed appropriate, then transferred to internal affairs if it needs to be. And that's something that we've done. We have, uh, you know, we, we have more cultural diversity training with, with our officers. Those are just some highlights from that. If you look at the data analysis and transparency, earlier or last year, we contracted with the University of Texas El Paso to analyze the department's limited detention data on traffic and pedestrian stops, and we also made that data public. You know, we had promised that uh, that data was going to be public. Now, the, the thing about it was, is the data from UTEP was very, was very positive for the police department, but there were also some areas that uh, showed um, disparities. 
Now, as the UTEP professor, disparity doesn't mean something was done right or wrong. It is just a disparity, but we know how our community sees that. So understanding that part of it is why we really wanted to do a lot for our community, put a lot in the emotional bank account. So I didn't want to wait for the analysis on the UTEP to come back to then start doing things. So that's one of the major things that kind of we have like a little, a little playbook so to speak, where, you know, if we're going to launch these big, big initiatives and really open this department up, uh, uh, you know, to be transparent, we want to ensure that we've done a lot of things beforehand that uh, almost assuming that we may, that almost assuming that we always have to move forward. And so starting that before is very, very important. Uh, obviously, uh, we contracted with police strategies to analyze uh, and make our public use of force data available. The last time this police department uh, in 2000 and I believe it was 2007 or 2008 was the very last time that we put out a very, I'll call it antiquated even at the time, a very antiquated use of force model and that simply just had to do with numbers uh, and individuals and it didn't have, uh, and, it, and, and it came out once a year. And so once a year, it was always the big news. San Jose Police Department releases their use of force data. Well, you know, again, we have nothing to hide here, uh, especially with regards to force. So one of the things that I was looking for is to have um, a mechanism by which I can put our use of force data on our website and then make it and then uh, update it quarterly so it's always up. Because I, my, the comment that I made when I first wanted to do this was I only wanted to make it news once. Here, we launched this, and now it's just the way we do business. And we we're really looking for a tool to do that. Uh, and it's really, really, truly helped us. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've changed our report writing process, requiring all of our supervisors to approve rep reports. When it comes to training, uh, you know, obviously a lot of departments have crisis intervention training. Uh, but we're, we mandated the entire department get trained with it. Uh, we've gone through procedural justice training, de-escalation training, fair and impartial uh, policing training, and then just a lot of community engagement. Um, you know, we know that we have to be out in the community. We have to be seen in the community. And so we've done a lot of things to that end, as you can see on that right column, whether, you know, you know I'm expanding. I have a community advisory board. We established an LGBTQ advisory committee. Uh, and we all we do uh, team kids, and we hold coffee with a cop events throughout the city. And so we're very very active in the community, uh, and really the truly the officers are uh, truly uh, you know bought in to the concept that we're that we're that we're doing here in San Jose. The use of force uh, data and dashboard and portal, uh, I call it kind of a breathing living thing. Um, we put dashboards up publicly. Uh, of ones we can do. Uh, obviously, in California, we have uh, our California uh, Bill of Rights for our officers, which, you know, the Bill of Rights differs from state to state. Ours is fairly one of the strictest uh, in the country. And so we put things on our dashboard, obviously, that we can, but there's still a lot of information, very robust, that allows the community to drill down on certain items. Uh, and uh, we came up with the dashboards that we felt the community uh, wanted to see, and we put those up there. So that's kind of a, a, you know, somewhat of an overview of what our rationale here uh, in San Jose is. You know, the mantra, the ultimate mantra for all my rank and file is my, what my expectation is, and my expectation is is to reduce crime, but while at the same time building community trust. And that's, uh, and that's really what we measure ourselves by. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, and I wanted to go in now, and we, we will have time. I see there are a few questions that have popped up, but we'll have time at the end for questions for, for sure. Um, but I wanted to, to shift now into use of force data collection. And, and Chief Garcia mentioned um, uh, a bit about um, uh, the, the program that was launched um, uh, this year um, in San Jose earlier this year. Um, and we saw earlier that there are some attempts being made at the FBI and by different organizations to collect use of force data. Um, one of the challenges is that many agencies that are collecting use of force data, data do it on a very limited basis. So they'll say how many use of force they have. They might say, you know, how many taser use, how many 
um, firearm, how many officer involved shootings and that kind of thing, but it's all based on, on simple frequency data. And when we collect use of force in order to do a, a, a thorough analysis, we need to get the full context around the force incident. So we need to know what happened before the officer decided to use force. What was, what was the original call type? What threat was the officer facing? We need to know the dynamics between the officer and the suspect during the force incident, what level of force was used, what resistance was, was provided. And then we need to know what happened after the force. Were there any injuries to the officer and the suspect? How was the suspect restrained? Um, what was the disposition in terms of charges and so forth. And that gives us the full context of the use of force incident. And then we need to collect data at different levels. We need incident level data, such as date, time, and location. We need suspect information, the demographics of the suspect, age, race, and gender, the threat level resistance, and we need officer information. And if you just report on data at, at, at an agency level, very high level, it's not going to tell you much about how your individual officers are using force. So you need all of that officer detail as well. And then um, every use of force uh, in the country is governed by the same Supreme Court standard. And that's in a 1989 case in Graham v. Connor. And what Graham v. Connor says is it takes an objective reasonableness standard. And it says when you evaluate whether use of force was constitutional, you need to put yourself in the shoes of the officer and evaluate the case based upon what the officer knew at the time and the threats that the officer was facing. And as long as the officer behaved reasonably, as a reasonable officer would, under those same circumstances, uh, then the force will be found to be constitutional. And so we've developed, uh, in order to analyze each use of force incident under this standard, um, statistically, we've developed two different analytical scales. So we have a force justification analysis that uses the four factors in Graham v. Connor, the severity of the crime, the threat to the officer or others, the level of resistance, and whether the suspect fled. Those are the four Graham factors. And those form our justification analysis, so we can see the level of justification of each force incident. And then we want to know whether the force was potentially excessive. And we, we've developed a force factor analysis. It was actually developed by Professor Jeff Alpert at the University of South Carolina in the 1990s. And it looks at the proportionality of force to resistance, so you can get a general sense of of, of whether the force was potentially excessive. And this gives you a way to do a risk analysis of each and every uh, use of force incident, as well as a risk analysis of the force practices of individual officers. And the, the way that we do that is we take incident reports from each agency. So each use of force incident will have some type of reporting function. Some will have a, a separate database. Um, but every department, when, when an officer uses force, they will document in detail what happened in their officer narratives and in the incident report itself. And we take those reports and we have various processes, machine learning, natural language processing, and we run it through legal algorithms, and we extract 150 different data fields from each report. And then we after processing the data, we provide the agency with a series of dashboards that they can then use to query their own data. Um, and because we're collecting data from multiple agencies and analyzing it exactly the same way, we can uh, also compare um, interagency, do interagency comparisons. So your agency compare your use of force practices with other agencies that are in the system. And these dashboards, this is a, the San Ho, one of the San Jose dashboards, uh, and they're very uh, intuitive. They're all interactive. Um, this is just a screenshot. But on, on each of these dashboards, um, you will have, for, for example, for San Jose, we coded three years' worth of data. There are 200, 2009 uh, use of force incidents during that three-year period. And you can get detail on the locations and the types of when and where and who is using force. And so there, there are about 50 dashboards in total that the agency gets, and the, the, the most useful dashboards from a, from a risk management perspective are the ones that look at individual officers so the, the department can tell very quickly and easily where their outlier officers are, not just in terms of how often their officers use force, but how well their officers are using force. And they're able to identify the higher risk officers, look more deeply at those cases and determine whether there are any corrections that needed to be made in terms of training or policies or supervision. 
And as the chief mentioned, um, some of the dashboards we've modified and placed on the uh, San Jose Police website. And we put those uh, dashboards on the website in January, and so far we've had uh, just about 3,000 users, most of whom are from the San Jose area. Um, and and the great thing about these dashboards is that is that uh, just like the department can query its data, the public can now query use of force data for San Jose. So they can look uh, geographically by region and beat and neighborhood. They can look at trends over time. They can see what type of weapons and and physical tactics officers are using. Um, they can look at demographics of suspects, and they can get a better sense of of how the department is is using force. And um, one of the things we did in San Jose, and, and Chief, if there's anything you'd like to, to pipe in since I'm talking about your agency, feel free. Um, sure. But we did some uh, presentations for different community groups, and these are generally groups that are, are very active and involved in policing issues and are very knowledgeable of the department, but this is the first time they'd ever seen um, the use of force data in this detail. And what well, things if I could if I just just chime in yep. real quick from a chief's perspective on that, Bob, and, and it when I talked about earlier about the blueprint or the playbook, you know, the reality has been whether it's the UTEP study on our on our on our on the racial disparities on our vehicle stops or pedestrian stops, or whether it's use of force. Uh, what I found in those two cases is the perceptions are are far far worse than what the realities are, and. Oftentimes, uh, which has been here, and we have a great relationship, I have a great relationship with my community, but oftentimes it's been very difficult to accept, uh, accept some of the, uh, the findings on their face. And so what I would always say is really you can never, never just drop this on your community, what the results are. Uh, before having met with the stakeholders and allowing them to vent their frustrations or questioning the data or questioning the methodology so you don't leave it up to the day that you release your data. Um, and I can't, I, if, there, if, there was, if there were three things that I would say that's most important in all of these processes is doing that. Right. We we met with the community groups uh, last December, and then the data was and re the report was released released publicly in January. And and as the chief mentioned, I mean, it's so important to have to not just sort of throw the data out there because there's so much information, and it's all most of it's brand new, and people have never seen this type of data before. So it's really important to be able to have a dialogue and exchange, and be able to answer questions and really explain the the, the depth of the data. And I wanted to, to show you some of the, the data that we presented with the community groups, and one of them was about the types of, of weapons that, that officers use during force incidents. And over the last few years, um, San Jose PD has started implementing uh, tasers more often. Um, and uh, I, know, I know from discussing with the community groups that some, some community members were, were opposed to that, and they, they for, for whatever reason, they, they were opposed to the use of tasers. And because like any, any device, I mean, there have been deaths and serious bodily injuries associated with electronic control devices, just as there are with, with any force technique. Um, but there wasn't the data to show what, exactly what was happening. So what we were able to show is that while the, the use of electronic control devices, or tasers commonly known, uh, was, was pretty much stable and after having ramped up in the earlier years, and the injuries that typically result from a, a taser use or probes when, the, when, when it's used in probe mode and two probes are, are launched and they strike the skin and embed in the skin. So they're relatively minor, minor injuries, sort of like a fish hook injury. Uh, but, there, but it does create some injuries. And, but what we saw is that as tasers were ramping up, um, the use of physical strikes was declining. And the bruises and cuts that resulted from physical strikes was also declining. And more importantly, the use of impact weapons was declining, and impact weapons were primarily responsible for fractures of subjects. And uh, fractures almost went to zero in 2017 as the use of impact weapons went down. So essentially, the, 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 the officers were using force at the same rate, 
but they were basically substituting electronic control devices for physical strikes and impact weapons, the result being that these more serious injuries were going way down in exchange for the, the taser probe injuries. And when some members of the community saw this data, it completely changed their perception of tasers. And they said, well, we understand that, that if, if officers are using more tasers, they're going to use less impact weapons, and we would prefer officers to use tasers than impact weapons, so perhaps it's not that bad a thing for officers to use tasers. So it was really exciting to sort of see that sort of immediate realization and understanding of the dynamics of, of, of this incident, of this uh, uh, issue. And now I want to talk about some of the key findings that we've found in the use of force data. We currently have 32 agencies in the system with over 5,000 use of force reports, and we're able to make some, some uh, uh, general findings of, of uh, use of force, uh, and, and some of it you may find counterintuitive. Um, the first finding is that uses of force are linked to arrests. So, so the more arrests, a department makes, the more arrests an officer makes, the more uses of force they're going to have. And what that means is that your, your most proactive and productive officers who are making more arrests are going to have more uses of force. And that doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, that they're doing anything wrong. The fact that they have more uses of force are generally a factor of how active they are than whether they're using uh, a force appropriately. And on average, we find that about 4% of suspects that are taken into, into custody will resist. And uh, while there are a lot of things going on with de-escalation techniques and changes in policies and training, um, you're always going to have a certain percentage of subjects that are taken into custody that will resist, and no matter how many de-escalation techniques you, you, you use. And that's what we found to be about the average. And, and these kind of resistance rates vary a lot by the type of crime that's involved. So individuals that are on probation um, and are taken into custody resist the most. This, this is San Jose data from two years, uh, and 16% of them uh, are, uh, resist and have force used against them, primarily because they know they're on probation and they don't want to be taken into custody because they know they'll probably be taken back to jail. Similarly, disorderly conduct and trespassing, these are individuals that either don't want to leave or are already sort of um, out of control, and so it's harder to take them into custody and they're more likely to resist. Where you get down to traffic, traffic offenses and warrant arrests and sex crimes and drugs, they have very low resistance rates. So, so the, uh, the, the, the main driver in whether an officer uses force is the suspect uh, resistance. And so if a suspect resists, it's much more likely that that, that force will be used. So this is more of an indicator of, of the level of res resistance for different types of crimes. A second finding is that most use of force incidents are actually low discretion. And by that I mean that, that officers oftentimes really don't have a choice as to whether they, they need to use force. And I'll show you what we found uh, are the reasons for that. So in all these cases, and this is for, for all 32 agencies in our system, 38% um, of the time when force is used, it was because the suspect fled from the officer. And if the, if, the, if the suspect's under investigation and they're fleeing from the officer, uh, it's very likely that they will have, to, the only way the officer can catch them is to use some type of force. 25% um, of, of force involves a threat to the officer. So the suspect is either making verbal threats or some kind of furtive movements or they're moving towards the officer in some type of threatening manner. Um, in 12% of the cases, the officer is actually assaulted before the officer decides to use force. So they're simply defending themselves by, by using force. In 10% of the cases, this, the subject is, is either threatening or assaulting a third party when the officer is there. And so they use force in order to stop that threat or stop the assault. And that leaves 15% of the cases that don't meet any of these criteria. And these are high discretion. So these are the cases that, as, as, a, as, a, as a chief of police or as a supervisor, these are the cases you really want to focus on um, because they're the ones where the officer is making a discretionary decision to use force. And there's no flight, no threat, no assault, et cetera. 
A third finding is that most use of force happens soon after, after an officer contacts the suspect. So 39% of these cases, and you saw that 15% are discretionary, and the discretionary ones will all be more than one minute. Um, and so, so most of the force happens immediately when the officer arrives. And so there's some situation that's causing the officer to immediately use force. Usually it's because the suspect is fleeing. Um, about 33% happen within, within a minute, and then only 28%, there's some discussion and, and interaction and then eventually leads to force. So these are, these are incidents that generally happen very quickly. And another finding, and this, this is also uh, counterintuitive to a lot of people. So officers that use force more frequently tend to use force more appropriately. And by that, I mean that they, they use force with higher justification scores and lower force factor scores. So essentially, these are your most experienced officers who use force very effectively and only when necessary. And, and you can think of this as just experience. If, you, if you're a new officer and you've just been issued a taser and you've never used it in the field, the first time you use your taser, you're probably not going to use it as appropriately as an officer that's used force 20 times in the field and has experience using that technique. And so the, the reason that this, this finding is so important is because it runs contrary to every early warning system that's out there. Because early warning systems are based on frequency of force. And the way that, that an early warning system works is that it will uh, have some kind of, of trigger in the system. And it's all based on the frequency of force. So for example, if, if an officer has three or more uses of force in the last six months, then the system will trigger that officer for additional review. And so the supervisor will look at all that, that uh, officer's use of force and determine whether there are any issues that need to be addressed in terms of training or supervision. And the problem is, is that what you're, what you're targeting when you look at frequency, you're targeting those officers that use force most frequently, and our data shows use force most appropriately. And so if an officer only used force once or twice in a six-month period, but both of those uses of force were bad uh, and have a low justification or a high force factor, the system would completely ignore that. And, and it's much more likely that an officer has inappropriate force if they have fewer force incidents. And an example of this uh, sort of phenomenon of these high percentage of false positives is Los Angeles Police Department and their Teams 2 system, which is their early warning system. And they did an audit in 2014 and found that each month 200 officers were flagged for additional review because they met the, the criteria, but only 3% of those officers needed any kind of corrective action, which means that the system has a 97% false positive rate. Uh, so, so these early warning systems that are out there based on frequency are extremely ineffective, and you'll miss most of the officers that need the additional attention. Um, finally, I wanted to talk a bit about racial disparity, um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a much longer and involved topic, but by, by digging deeper into the data, there are a lot of racial disparity studies that are out there, and they're all based on frequency, and generally they use some type of population statistics or other types of benchmarks. And with San Jose, and this is in San Jose's annual report, um, we see that uh, with regards to disparity, when you're looking at a re uh, use of force per population, you see a large disparity for Hispanics and particularly for um, black suspects and underrepresentation of whites, Asians, and others. So the way to read this is that for, for black, black suspects are four times more likely to have force used against them than you would expect based upon their proportion of the population. And there are many problems, obviously, with using population as a benchmark um, uh, because the population doesn't necessarily represent those individuals who are coming into contact with police who are involved in a crime and being taken into custody and resisting. And when we look at the arrest, uh, the disparity between use of force and arrest rates, we see that the, all the disparity virtually disappears. And so what this is saying is, is that when, when uh, a suspect is arrested, they are no more or less likely based upon their race to have force used against them than any other race. So, so this is a much more you know, valuable statistic um, in terms of measuring disparity, and we see that for San Jose, that disparity is almost non-existent. So if I could just add on, on just on that little piece uh, real quick, um, or are you going? Are you going to our UTEP study? Um, 
No, I'm just doing. I just have one more slide. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, when it comes to the racial disparity, it's not too dissimilar from the UTEP study when it comes to uh, car stops, pedestrian stops curb sitting, temporary handcuffing, and things of that nature. Um, in the past, you know, the, the common thinking was always that the benchmark was population. Uh, and even when the professor, professor from the University of Texas, El Paso, said the same thing, that, and, they're stu and they were studying a different uh, element of policing, is that population was uh, arguably the worst benchmark to use as well. Right, and and unfortunately, most most studies use use population or other benchmarks that aren't aren't really relevant to the problem. But here, arrest we think is the best benchmark to look at frequency of force. Um, and finally, I wanted to show you another way that we can look at racial disparity. This is using the data that's in our system, looking at justification scores and force factor scores and injury rates. And again, we're we're not looking now at frequency, we're looking at how officers are using force and why officers are using force and whether that correlates with any particular um, subject demographics. And so when we look at these low justification scores, um, these are your highest risk cases and the only suspect characteristic that has a statistically significant correlation uh, with low justification score is age. And essentially that means that when, when officers are dealing with younger suspects, particularly juveniles, they wait to use force until there's a much higher level of threat or flight. Um, but all these other characteristics, gender, weight, drug or under the influence, mental health issues, race, height, the residence of the suspect, are not correlated in any way with an officer's decision to use force. Um, we compare that with these high force factor cases, and the high force factor means that the officer is using a very high level of force compared to resistance, so, so at risk of being um, excessive. And here we see several factors correlate. So when officers are dealing with older suspects or male suspects or heavier suspects, they're much more likely to use a higher level of force compared to resistance. Similarly, um, when officers are dealing with people who are not under the influence or have no mental health issues, they use a higher level of force. You can also read that as when they're dealing with suspects that are under the influence or have mental health issues, they use a lower level of force, which is exactly what you would like to see. Also, when a suspect flees or when they're armed or when they're involved in a more serious crime, the officers use a higher level of force compared to resistance. Um, and again, this is a lot of what you would expect to see because officers perceive or feel that they're facing a, a more serious threat, so they're using a higher level of force. Um, so that is our, is our presentation. We have about 10 minutes left for, for questions, and I'd really, really hope that, that uh, you found this useful. Thanks, Bob and uh, Chief Garcia um, for that great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and if there are any additional questions, uh, if you guys can just put them in the chat, we'll be sure to get to me as many of those as possible. We, uh, have, we have a couple of questions about the My90 app. Um, Chief, can you tell us about why it's called that, and then also can you tell us how long it has been used and how the community has responded to that app. Yeah, well, I, I should have be honest with you. I don't know why it's called My90. I think it, it was uh, it was a small company that started out of uh, two individuals. I went to Stanford, uh, and we piloted with the company at first. Um, again, I don't know why they, they chose to call it My90, but uh, actually, I, I actually talked to them about that, too, and I don't really remember what answer they gave me. But in any event, uh, we've been using it now uh, in, in whether it's before we're conducting operations, we've been using it now for over a year. Uh, and again, we use it in the context of two things. If there is a neighborhood in our city where that needs a significant uh, police presence and we're going to begin to conduct, you know, daily operations in that area, uh, we will... Uh, we will we will begin with the My90 app, and basically it's a cell phone app, and it works off your cell phone. So you basically give all your residents a number to call, and or a number to text. I'm sorry, a number to text, and then once they text that number, they get a response back, and the questions via text. Uh, we don't know who texts what, or we just get the aggregate data. 
and so uh, and so we we can we use it really for anything your that your imagination could can think of. I mean, we te technically. I mean, I, I like to drill down in the neighborhoods, but technically, you can, uh, you know, give it to, you know, uh, your vi victims, uh, and have them, you know, call this number to see how your service was. Uh, then you can do it for that purpose. But uh, but that's really the way it works. And again, we use it as a tool with our communities with regards to when we're at those community meetings. Is we'll base our conversations in our groups around their answers. To the uh, to the question, then the community has been really, really um, uh, they've been very, very uh, appreciative of the data. They're appreciative of the fact that we we just don't ask the easy questions. We ask the tough questions, and for them to know that it's uh, you know anonymous and that we'll never know who it is is a great part of the tool. Great, thanks. Um, you also mentioned, and, and Bob, maybe you can chime in here, but you also mentioned that this information is updated quarterly. Is that enough, or do we see a need to update that information maybe monthly, or how can you tell us about the, the frequency of the information? Sure. Um, most of the agencies we work with, um, we update on an annual basis. For for San Jose, because they have about 700 use of force a year, and the chief wanted more more frequent updates, uh, we're doing it quarterly. Um, this is the the system is really designed to give you a a historical look at at use of force and to look at trends and patterns and be able to ask questions about the the longer range. Um, the system does not replace uh, the regular review of individual use of force incidents. So, so San Jose Police, uh, every time force is used, a sergeant will do an investigation. They, they have their internal um, use of force uh, uh, records management system, that, and, and each use of force will be reviewed up the chain of command. Um, and so, so the, the use of the, the force analysis system enables uh, both both the the frontline supervisors as well as as uh, internal affairs when they get complaints to step back and look at all of the historical data to determine whether this this particular incident you know fits in and and is 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 part of um, uh, you know a potential pattern or trend that needs to be corrected or not and and so so it's really not that critical because these use of force reviews are going on immediately after the incident. It's not critical for the force analysis system to be updated in, in real time. Great. Thanks for that information. Uh, we also just had a, another question come in through the chat in regards to social media. And if you've noticed whether or not um, this app and this data collections helps uh, with for the department to react to uh, social media and maybe videos that go viral. Um, from a, you know, well, this app does does help. It absolutely helps. It paints a picture of something that we didn't have before. You know, if there's others that have that have been in community meetings like me, if if there's an incident uh, that hits social media, uh, it's 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 a little bit more difficult now. To be able to make, you know, build a false narrative around that the San Jose Police Department or ex Police Department is particularly uh, using force on uh, on X on X group, and having having this data, uh, really, that there are incidents that may occur, but you know, what our what our data told us is that that wouldn't be the case, and so. You're able to have these true, honest conversations about, oh, we're an imperfect profession and we will make mistakes, but uh, there is no type of culture issue that oftentimes takes on a life of its own when, when things go viral. And, Great. and I, just, I, I just wanted to add to that, um, you, have, you, know, you obviously have a lot of high-profile incidents. I mean, they happen every week, and, and one of the most recent ones in California is the, is the Sacramento um, shooting that happened a couple of months ago, a lot of uh, national attention on it. Uh, it there was a, a video, body cam footage of it, there are aerial footage of it, and whenever the department, you know, talks about use of force, it's all about that one particular incident. And so, so whenever you're looking at at a particular incident, particularly if it looks, you know, bad or questionable on video, 
the whole discussion around the department's use of force is going to revolve around that one particular incident. And there's no way to put it into, into context or to demonstrate that the department is constantly monitoring and aware of its officers' use of force and takes you know, corrective action when necessary. And that's obviously, you know, any system is not going to prevent any, any bad shooting or bad, bad use of force incident from happening. But it does show that, that a department is being as proactive as possible in monitoring and managing its officers. Okay, and we have a, another question here. Um, it says, uh, less than half of the San Jose residents speak English at home. Uh, we see that's 43%. Um, what is the department doing to ensure that the ESL community members build a dialogue uh, with the department? That's an excellent, excellent question. Matter of fact, our first, the first community meeting uh, that we launched this last year was one in uh, one of our areas where there was predominantly the, the language of Spanish. And so the My90 app, uh, well, first of all, we have bilingual officers in the department, but My, the My90 app also uh, comes in different languages, particularly Spanish as well. And, uh, and, and we're able, and for those uh, groups, as an example, that didn't have an officer who spoke Spanish, we also had translating services. And so we're mindful of that at every community meeting that we go to. Our, our city is beautifully diverse, um, and, uh, and we recognize that going, going into these. And so uh, we really do a lot with, 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 with our entire community throughout the city. It doesn't matter what part of the city uh, we're in for that. And that really, that really helps us out. And what we like to do is, is we don't necessarily have these global meetings, per se, in these divisions. We're actually much more surgical in the way we do it, and we actually go right to the source. So there's an area in San Jose called the, the Washington Neighborhood in San Jose, and it happens to be in the western division of our city, but we, don't have, we didn't have a general western division meeting in some, some part of the city that wasn't... Uh, a part that was vulnerable. Our meeting was directly in that vulnerable portion. We went right to the Washington Youth Center, which is right in that community group, and we knew that uh, we have a, a very large population that mostly speaks Spanish. And so going into that, we, 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 uh, we, did, we conducted outreach in that way. Uh, that's really great that you're, you're reaching out to people that way. Um, I think those are the only remaining questions that we have at this time. Uh, we really want to thank uh, Bob and uh, Chief Garcia for taking the time uh, to share your presentation with us. And um, we here at the National Civic League want to thank all of our attendees. You guys will be getting a follow-up email shortly, which will include a recording of the webinar as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and that video. And if you have any questions, you can always email us at ncl at ncl.org. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And we're signing off.